right? Um, nowadays, you know, things change so fast. Everything changes so fast. And technology is changing the way we live. Can you believe within several years, you can have lunch in New York and come back home? You know, Elon Musk, he is the CEO of a company called SpaceX. The company is inventing an aircraft, which is 10 times faster than the speed of sound. So it can take passengers from London to New York in 30 minutes. Wow. So we are living in this time. And you know, people can control their boilers and everything in their house with mobile phones in their workplaces nowadays. I went to um, the Toyota garage in Solihull Hall in Shirley and for MOT of my car. And they gave me a Curtis car and I couldn't drive the car away. <laughs> can you believe? It was a smart key, and I knew that I had to press the button to start the engine. It was so quiet. I thought, it's not working. <laughs> so I pressed it again and pressed several times, and then I realized, oh, it's a hybrid. Okay, the engine is run, you know, by the electronic power. And then I tried to find the handbrake lever. And I searched everywhere. I looked to my seat, you know, and I couldn't find it. Later, there was a small button, very small button. On that letter P was written. I pressed it, and then I could drive the car. Wow. One year ago, exactly on 24th March 2017, there was a an article in, in the Telegraph uh, which told about the life of uh, people in the UK. Uh, can you believe by, 20, 20, by 2030, one third of the jobs in the UK will be covered by robots? Robots will do one third of jobs in this country in a little bit over 10 years. So technology developed, medical treatment developed, science developed, and those things resolve many problems that we have in our lives, in our society. But there are two particular fundamental problems that have never been resolved, and they will remain unresolved continually. Do you know what they are? One is sin, the other one is death. Romans chapter 3 verse 23 says, all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says, the wages of sin is death. Sin and death affect our lives like a disease without cure. You know, um, there is a um, famous uh, philosopher called Kierkegaard, and he is a Danish uh, philosopher and theologian. He wrote many books, but one of them is The Sickness Unto Death. Human beings have a sickness unto death. And the book has two parts. The first part is about what is the sickness. And he says, the sickness unto death is despair. In the second part, he defined what is despair. He said, the despair is sin. The point that he wants to make in the book is that everybody sins because of their sins. They are subject to death. And you know, there are two different kinds of death in the Bible. The first death and the second death. Many people never heard about the second death. The first death is about our physical death. Everybody will die. We all die. There was a Caribbean lady in our church in Kitts Green. You know, her name was Kathy, and she sang the song, this song all the time. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. <laughs> we all die one day. We all die one day. What is the second death then? The second death is eternal separation from God. You know, 
between the first death, uh, physical death, and the second death, there will be judgment of God according to the Bible. Everybody will be judged after their death. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 says, All are doomed to die once, and then they face judgment of God. According to the results of the judgment of God, some will spend their eternity in heaven, and others will spend eternity in hell. Sin and death will lead people to hell. Several days ago, uh, Pope Francis, he denied the existence of hell. And I was not surprised. But I want to tell you, the hell, hell does exist. And hell is the place where people who do not trust in Christ will suffer, not only once, but continually in eternity without an end. I like this man, but he passed away. Dr. Sproul, I, I love him. And his speech and his intellectual ability and his piety in his personal life. Dr. Sproul, he said, the biggest mistake that this contemporary Christianity is making is that preachers do not emphasize about judgment of God and hell enough. We are so gentle and we are so kind to people without knowing that our gentleness and nice attitude kill people. It is dangerous. And he continued, if there is no judgment and hell, there is no need of the cross of Jesus and his resurrection. If God is only love and he does not send the people to hell, there was no reason for Christ to come to bear our sins on the cross and to be crucified on the cross. There was no reason for him to rise again from the dead if there is no judgment after death. Sin and death must be dealt with. Not only to escape from hell in the future, but also to have new life in Christ while we are living on earth. And how do we deal with them? And what can I do to have a new life in Christ while I am living in this world? I want to tell you the difference between religions and Christianity. Christianity is, is not a religion. It is a relationship with the living God. And religions are about people seeking their gods, whoever they are, whatever they are. But Christianity is about God seeking sinners. There is a difference. Religions say to people, do this and don't do that. But Christianity says, it is done. It is done. It is finished. Tetra last time, we heard it on Friday. Wendy brought you know, the poem, and Steve, he interpreted it. It is paid in full. Your sins, my sin, everything has been paid in full. So what can we do to deal with the sin and death in our lives? The Bible says you have nothing to do to deal with the sin and death apart from, listen carefully, apart from being baptized into Christ Jesus. That is the scripture that we read this morning. You have to be baptized into Christ. Why? Because Christ dealt with the sin on the cross. And he dealt with death through his resurrection. The cross of Jesus and his resurrection dealt with the sin and death. He dealt with it. Nothing to do. But we have to be baptized into Christ Jesus. And what is the meaning to be baptized into Christ Jesus? The, the scripture says that we have to be united with Christ in his death and in his resurrection. What does it mean? We are united. We have to be united with Christ in his death and in his resurrection. Let's talk about 
being united with Christ in his death first. If you look at verse 6 in chapter 6, it says, Our old self was crucified with Christ so that we are no longer enslaved to sin. And there is a misunderstanding in terms of being united with Christ. People normally think that to be united with Christ, Christ alone should be crucified on the cross for us. That is a mistake. That is a misunderstanding. Being united with Christ is more than intellectual agreement that Christ died to sin. The actual meaning of being united with Christ means that we are also crucified with him to, to sin. We, all the selves, should be crucified on the cross with Christ. And there, in that way, we are united with Christ. If only Christ was crucified, but I am not, then I have, new, I have no new life in me yet. The Bible says, whoever is in Christ is a new creation. Whoever is in Christ, how can we be in Christ without being baptized into Christ, without dying with him, without being crucified with him? This old self, my flesh, should be crucified with him together. And that is the meaning of being baptized into Christ. And there are many people who go to church, who know that Christ died on the cross for me and for them, but they have never been crucified with Christ together. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Again, chapter 5, verse 24, those who belong to Christ have crucified their sinful nature with its passions and desires. So to become a Christian means to be crucified with Christ together on the cross. In that way, we are baptized into Christ. Two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I preached about discipleship. And I mentioned several uh, uh, ways to become uh, good Christians and good um, disciples. The first one was dethronement. Dethronement. Who is sitting on the throne in your heart? If still you are sitting on the throne, you are the king of your life. I have to be dethroned from the throne in my heart. And Christ should sit down on the throne. And he should rule in my life. He should reign in my life. And that is the meaning to be crucified. In other words, we must be buried with Christ. We have to be buried. You know, there are four different sects in Jesus' time. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Zealots, and then the Essenes. Do you know them, who they are, Essenes, the Essenes? We normally think that John the Baptist was from this particular sect, the Essenes. They had very strong rules and regulations to keep the community very holy and pure. And they had one particular uh, religious kind of practice when they baptize their believers. They lived in the wilderness, so water was not there. And do you know how they baptized their, their believers? When they confessed their faith, professed their faith in Christ and before people, they dig a hole like a pit. It's like a rectangular shape, uh, similar size to a coffin. And they laid them one by one. And they sprinkled sand on them. It's a kind of personal burial, personal crucifixion, and personal funeral service in Christ. And they confessed, Lord, I die in you. I no longer live in my life but you. Do you know what they confessed when they raised up from the pit of death? My life will never be the same again. This is the meaning of being crucified with Christ. To be baptized into him. 
I'm sorry, this is a kind of repetition of what Steve said, actually. I, I, I was so glad to listen to uh, the sermons that he brought for the five weeks about the new covenant. And he talked to us you know, about the meta-narrative of, of, of baptism in the Bible from the beginning. It's an incredible story. We have to study all those things together again and again. Baptized into Christ. Dying with Christ. My life will never be the same again, they confessed. I know a pastor called Suresh Menon. He was my pastor before I came to Shirley. I attended a church called Grace Church in Worcester Park. And he told a story about himself. He was a secondary school student. And he and his friend James, they cheated in the examinations. Have you done it? I did, actually. I confess. They cheated in the exams. Uh, Suresh was good at math, and uh, James was good at science. So they discussed how to help each other. So on the first week, there were three modules in, in math. So Suresh, you know, he was good at math. So he solved all the questions, and he showed his friend the answer sheet. Like this. Look at, look at. And, and he copied all the answers. So they passed. They had good grades. They spent the weekend, and next Monday they came back to school. Suresh came earlier than James. James was coming into the classroom, and he looked so sad, James. And Suresh asked him, what's wrong with you? Well, just I feel not good today. Did you have a bad weekend? No, 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 no. I had a wonderful, excellent weekend. And this weekend was the best weekend in my life. Oh, then why you are so sad today? Suresh, listen. I want to tell you what. I cannot do it any longer. What? 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 What are you talking about? Cheating. What? I helped you, and from today on, you have to help me. I haven't studied science. <laughs> what happened to you? Well, I went to a revival meeting at the weekend, and I met Christ. The preacher told me that he was crucified for me. And he was rose, risen again from the grave. And I confessed my sins. And I was forgiven. And I have made my decision not to live the life that I used to live. So, Suresh, I cannot do it. Hearing all those things, Suresh said, Hey man, I am a Christian too. I'm a Christian too. You are just one day Christian, but I am 10 years Christian. And Jim says, okay, listen, that is the point I want to make to you today. You must be crucified with Christ. Let's stop sinning. It's not right before the Lord. That was the moment that Thresh was changed, and he became a pastor. We need a challenge with the gospel. And Sura said, from that time on, he has not lived the life that he used to live. Changed. When we are baptized into Christ, when our self is crucified with Christ on the cross together, we cannot live the life that we used to live. Being baptized, being united with Christ. Second one, I will finish it soon. Being baptized, being united with Christ in his resurrection. If, if you look at verse 10, he says, it says, the life he lives, he lives to God. What does it mean? Christ lives in God who is life. God is life and Christ is living in him who is life. If we are united with Christ in his resurrection, we are also in the life of God. Paul, he was so much thrilled in chapter 15 of the book of Corinthians, he said, wow, death has been swallowed up in victory through the resurrection. He said, oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. 
But thanks to be God, thanks be to God, He gives us the victory over death through our Lord Jesus Christ. The power of cross is much stronger than the power of sin and death. Do you know? Oh, to see my name written in the wounds, for through your suffering I am free. Death is cross to death. Life is mine to live. Life is mine to live. Death is cross to death. One through your selfless love, the power of the cross and the resurrection is much stronger than the power of sin and death. There was a file, a wire, wild fire in my, in my area when I was young. The fire was in a huge scale. It destroyed everything. Everything was burnt. Everything was melted down. There was a Buddhism temple in Korea in my area that was more than over 1,000 1, years. And there was a huge bronze bell uh, in the temple, three meters high and 1.5 meter wide, three times, four times bigger than this pulpit. That was meltdown on that day. The fire has got power. I couldn't find any evidence of life in that area after the fire. But believe in me, after one year, I could see small green shoots coming out of the ground. Very small, tiny. All the big trees were, were dead, but small, tiny green shoots were coming out, growing, blossomed, and covered the dark and gray and black field with the power of life. This is the power of life. We have been through you know, a one week prayer last week, during the week. We have been reading uh, the, the farewell discourse of Jesus Christ from chapter 13 to 17 of the John's Gospel. When we read chapter 15, you know, you, you know what, what is in, in John chapter 15. Uh, it, tells, it, it tells about the metaphor of the vine and the branches. And there are three different types of branches there. I'm sorry, I will finish this soon. Three different branches. One, branches remaining in the vine, bearing fruit. Branches remaining in the vine, not bearing the fruit. Branches cut off, thrown out, thrown away, and withered and dried. And there is no evidence of life. There is no sign of life in those branches. They are just thrown away. And I, I had a question in my life. There are many people who are like these branches, cut off, thrown away, withered, no life in that. Many people are living in this situation. And there is a question in my life, in my, in my mind. Do they have a chance to a life? Do you think? Can God make them alive, do you think? Again? My answer to the question is yes. And God drew my attention to an event in the Old Testament. In Numbers chapter 16 and 17, there is an event. You know, Korah and Dathan and Abiram, all the leaders from different tribes in Israel, they came to rebel against Moses and Aaron. And that broke uh, Moses' heart and Aaron's heart. Especially they doubted about the authority of Aaron in his priesthood. And Moses asked them to bring one staff from each tribe. And he asked them to write down the name of the head of the tribe. So write down their name and bring one particular staff from your tribe. So Moses had 12 staffs with him. And he gathered them and he brought them to the temple of God, to the tabernacle of God. He put them in front of God, just arrayed. The very next day, Moses went to the tabernacle and he found one particular stuff that sprouted, budded, blossomed, even producing fruits. Can you think about this? A stuff? Do you have any stuff here today? 
a staff completely that is metal one. <laughs> I'm looking for a wood, wood one. It is completely dry. Think about this wood here. It is dried and withered, and it hasn't got any vitality of life in that. But can you believe this dead, completely dead wood can sprout and bud it and blossom and produce fruit? Can you believe it? Yes. Why this can happen? Why? Because God is not only the source of life, but He is life. To Him, nothing is impossible. For man, it is impossible. How can I make this blossom? No, I cannot do that. But God, God can do that. God is the life, and the life has got power to make every single dead alive. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Branches thrown out, withered, stuff which is completely dried and solid, it can blossom through the power of life. And this is the message for us today in this resurrection day. Do you feel, do you feel that you are like a branch cut off, thrown away, withered, and no power, no vitality of life in your life today? Come to him today. Come to him. Let's be baptized with Christ in his death and in his resurrection. He's calling you today. He's calling you today. Do not hard, harden your heart. Respond to the call of God, to the call of the gospel. He's calling you. Do not remain like a branch thrown away, withered. The life of God is available today when you come to Him. Come to Him. His life is available today for everybody here this morning. He's calling you. Respond to the call this morning. The life of God is there with you this morning. Shall we pray? Shall we pray? Do Young, could you play a song? Let's think about the word that we heard this morning.